the unexamined life is not worth living socrates are you leading an unexamined life not living up to your full potential that's the premise of today's episode at seekers mind talks we're joined by a remarkable guest professor dan arielli he's a world leading expert in behavioral economics and psychology as a professor at the duke university and the author of groundbreaking best sellers like misbelief the honest truth about dishonesty and predictably irrational dan has dedicated his career looking into the nature of human behavior his work delves into why we make decisions that are often against our best interest and how we can understand them to lead better lives as usual i'm your host raj and enjoy the conversation with dan on the seekers mind talks what what are you up to in these days what what are your main projects wow, wow. <clears throat> so my main kind of interest these days is in the last chapter of people's lives so think about the time from the time when people have a diagnosis of a terminal illness and feel the end of life that period in the western world is about 5 years slightly longer than 5 years on average and it's uh, thanks to medical science that people live much longer uh, in this in this chapter but and my interest of course is on the social science side is to think about all the mistakes that people do um, and mistakes i mean generally speaking all the things that are not ideal that people do in this last chapter and then think about how we can make it better and here is my kind of thought experiment imagine somebody was just diagnosed with a terminal illness and imagine they came into my care and i had all the time in the world i mean as long until they die but i had nothing else to do i could just help them and i was there for them in terms of helping them figure out what they want to communicate with who they want to communicate i would help them track the symptoms i would help them find something happy to do every day i would help them find a purpose in life i would try to find the things they haven't had the time to do and they might want to finish doing i would help them with their legacy with uh, medications i mean imagine like i could do a holistic hand holding for these people until until they pass away and now imagine that that person passed away and 10 minutes later we got to ask them one more question after they passed away and the question we got to ask them if you could pick another chapter of your life to live again which one would you pick and my question is can it be that most people would pick the last chapter i mean you done the right way and when i talk to palliative care experts they think that most people would pick that chapter and and the reason is that you know we live an unexamined life uh, mostly tomorrow is going to be kind of like today and not very different and there's not many times in life in which we stop we think and we say why don't we like about our lives and what are we willing to change but that sad event of a terminal illness diagnosis can under the right circumstances give people an opening to change their lives and people who do it well uh, fix social relationships they stop doing things that don't seem very fruitful when they focus on the things that are more meaningful to them you know if each of us look at our lives we say oh you know we're doing a mix of things some things we're happy with some things we're not happy with there's some things we haven't resolved now it's kind of a sad statement to say that we need a terminal illness diagnosis to to refocus our life but i think it it is true that it is a very very helpful uh, refocusing on life and it can be used in a, in a positive way so so i'm looking at this last chapter and there's lots of sad things about it but i also think that there's lots of ways to make things better so that's that's one of my biggest projects and then completely differently um during covid i tried two new things uh, one is i joined some friends in la and we wrote together first a pilot but then a tv show called the irrational 
Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's it shows on NBC and it's a, it's a show based on on me. It's about a social scientist who teaches at the university and helps the FBI solve crime. And now we're writing and filming the second season. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I also, during COVID, decided to try something new. So I started uh, trying to write kids' books. So I, I found an illustrator and we just are finishing the first kid book. It's a book on a kid who is struggling with procrastination. So it's not too far away from social science, but it aims for a very different uh, age and, and, and focus. And that's been fun as well. And then, um, oh, and then one other thing is I, I just started a new website called the Center for Advanced Bureaucracy, <laughs> where I share my, my anger and frustration with bureaucracy. Yeah, I saw clips on that. Uh... <laughs> you're 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 focusing more about bureaucracy now, and uh, I wanted to touch base with that quote you said about an unexamined life versus an examined life. Uh, most people, this is my thinking. Most people, mostly, unless we have such a trigger of a terminal illness, we love to live an unexamined life. What are the consequences of that, and what are we losing? Yeah. when we are not living an examined life so so first of all you know if you think about evolution um our brain takes a lot of energy you know we think that we just burn energy with physical activity no thinking burns lots of energy and we have a mechanism in our brain called the default network that is supposed to quiet the brain it's supposed to get the brain to use less less energy Right, we are we're designed not to consume too much energy. So that's that's one element. The second element is that an examined life is a very tough thing. Right, if you wake up every day and you ask yourself, you examine my assumptions. Do I love my work? Do I love my country? Do I love my significant other? Am I enjoying my hobbies? You know, it, like it's very very tough to do. It's a lot of work. Right, so. When we say that people live an unexamined life, it's very understandable. There's lots of things that, that, that force that. I also don't think that people should continuously examine life all the time. I think we should do it once in a while. Right? So mm-hmm, I think a mm-hmm. midlife crisis is a good opportunity. Terminal illness diagnosis is a new opportunity. Uh, moving jobs is a good opportunity. Um, but, but the consequence is that we end up doing that we... We end up doing things we fell into, and once we fall into something, it gets a life of its own. And if we don't think about it, it can eventually become bigger than what we what we hoped for. So you know, I think that there's not that many things that we take on without thinking. I think most things we take on. Oh, you know, I'll take on this other job, I'll promise to do this. We take on these things, we think a little bit about them. But then things have a a way to to change and to expand. And we don't revisit those decisions. Mm -hmm. And then we end up doing the same thing again and again and again. We just take it as a working assumption. Mm -hmm. And and, and the working assumptions about life are actually very, very broad. They're about almost everything um, uh, our relationship with our kids we have kind of a script of how to do it our relationship with our parents we have a script about what it is uh, our relationship with our romantic partners we have a script how it is and all of those things have a history and a script and we don't get very often to sit and figure out, is this script working for me? Is this, is this the right script or do I want to change it? And, and again, I'll, uh, I'm guessing you're from an Indian origin? Yes, you're right. So, so think about arranged marriages in India. Mm-hmm. Lots of value for the scripts. You know, there's a, there's a study that is asking the question of who is happier in India? People who are getting married in arranged marriages 
of people who are getting arranged in love marriages. And if you think about when people get married, people who get married in love marriages are happier, people who are getting arranged in arranged marriages are less happy. But it turns out that on average, the arranged marriages increase in happiness and love marriages decrease in happiness and they cross at about year three. Wow, that's new now information this, for me. <laughs> now, this study is quite a few years old and you know, maybe things change about the, the speed of the decay and the growth and so on. And of course, it's also different people. But if you look at this as a metaphor, if you look at this as a metaphor, when people get married into an arranged marriage, they have a script. The society expects them to do specific things. And, and that script is limiting, but it's also very helpful, mm -hmm. right? Because you have something to rely on that on average has helped lots of people. So, so I think there's lots of things working against living an examined life, and it's not easy. But I think from time to time, it's very good to take a pause and ask yourself, mm. what is really working for us? What is not? And, and it's, a, it's a complex question because we don't always even know what we don't know. Take, for example, something like sleep. And I don't mean, I don't want to talk about sleep. I just want sleep as a metaphor. <laughs> Do you really have a sense of how better you could sleep if you slept differently? The answer is no. <laughs> you you sleep the way you sleep. And if I tell you, oh, by the way, you could sleep 20% better, you don't even know how to imagine that. It's outside of your constraint, right? If I said, you know what? I have something to tell you. You could be, imagine we talked about intelligence. Intelligence is, is easy to imagine because we're all bounded by our intelligence. If I say, please imagine somebody who is one feet taller than you, you can imagine that. You've seen those people. If I say, please imagine somebody who's 25% smarter than you, you don't even know what it means. And, and you know, we are, we are in an internal state. We're locked into our happiness and worldview and so on. And with physical things, we can say, oh, I understand somebody is faster. If somebody is faster, I can understand it. If somebody has a brain that is faster, I don't even know what it means. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a study a few weeks ago that showed that some people have a higher resolution for refresh rate of, in their brains. So they say, for example, professional tennis players, everything for them is like in slow motion. Oh, you know, okay. they just see things at a higher resolution. Their brain just works at higher resolution. So it looks really fast for us, for them it's a different speed. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how to imagine that. So anyway, so, so the point is that when we think about the unexamined life, there are things we can speculate. We can say, what if I, I used to love my job, I love my job a little bit less, I can imagine that maybe I need to love it more. But there are also some things that we can't imagine. And, and the things that are purely subjective experiences are mm -hmm. things that are very hard to compare to other people. Think about romantic love. We each have, yeah, we see some things in Hollywood, we see some things in Bollywood, we have a sense, but in terms of the feeling, we are bounded by our past history. Do we really know what's the potential for romantic love? The prior expectations set it, right? That's right. So, so we say, okay, you know, here is, here is three people I loved before, and here is the range of what I had before, and yeah, maybe I could do slightly better than that. But maybe there's a way to love twice as much and to feel love twice as much. But, but it's, un, unless we experience it. So, so when we say the unexamined life, the, the reason I'm, I'm spending time on this is that when we say the unexamined life, we think that if we can only sit on the sofa and think a bit be a deep, deeper, that will solve everything. But the reality is that there are, there are internal states that no amount of sitting on the sofa would help. Mm -hmm. Like if I ask you, what is your potential for romantic love? The answer is sitting on the sofa will not help. You know, the, right. the things that would help is 
to try new things. Uh, the thing to understand how sleep could work would be to try it mm -hmm. or meditation. You know, you need to meditate for a while in order to understand what it gives you. Nobody can explain to you. Like people, I, I don't meditate. I, I, I never have the, the, the patient. I, I really want to, but it, it stresses me out. I close my eyes. I try to meditate. I end up thinking about all the things I'm behind on. But, you know, people who meditate for a while acquire something that they can't. They, they say it's wonderful, but they can't communicate to the non-meditators and we have, don't have the tools to understand what it is. So there are all kinds of things in life that it's not enough to just sit and think. We need to experiment with it. We need to try it out. But the starting point of that potential that we are talking about, of a different way of doing things or, or, or that 20% more romantic partner that we are missing out because of our prior influences is always starting from an exam in life, right? And right. the actions from there. So we need, we need to basically say, uh, maybe this is not good enough. Mm -hmm. we, need, we, we need to stop doing and start, start questioning. And there are things that we can question. We can say, oh, here's the mistake. I'm identifying it. And there are things we're saying, I don't know if I could do better than that. But I want to try. I want to see what, what could be done. Hmm. Uh, our world, do you feel our world is getting more and more driven by cheap dopamine? <laughs> because dopamine is our driving factor for doing things, for doing actions, and we're getting a lot of it now without the action that, that, was, that is necessary to drive the world. Do you feel that we're going in that direction? So, so I, think, I think we are getting into an attention economy of quick things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's addictive, it's addictive. So psychologically, from a psychological perspective, uh, there was this incredibly important in, uh, psychologist called B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner was the, the father of behavioralism. And, and he, he, he did lots of things, but one of the things he did was he compared fixed schedule of reinforcement with random schedule of reinforcement. And he basically said the following, imagine two rats, he did it for real, so you don't need to imagine, but there are two rats. One rat presses a hundred times on their liver and they get the pellet of food. The other rat presses the, the liver, it also gets a food, but the number of presses is random. It's between one to 200. So it's the same expected value on average, it's a hundred, but the, the one of them has a very predictable. Every time they press 100, they get it. The other one, it's unpredictable. It's between 1 and 200. And the question is, which rat will work harder? Which harder would work faster? Which rat would continue working even if the reward stops showing? And the answer is the random, the random schedule of reinforcement. Because with the, the, the rat that gets it every 100 times says, like, it's press three, it's press four. I know it's long term away. The other rat says, maybe it's the next one. Maybe it's the next one. <laughs> maybe it's the next one. So they're much more excited about keep on pressing and they press faster and faster. Now, a lot of the world has kind of discovered that. Right? So Las Vegas, of course, is all about that, right? If Las Vegas said, every 10 times you put quarters in the, in the, in the slot machine, you'll get nine quarters back, people would stop, right? It's the randomness. Maybe now it will be a lot. Uh, but also a lot of the things on our phones are like that, right? Uh, you get notifications um, and every notification you get, you say, maybe this is really important. The odds are very low, right? Most likely it's not the case, but you say, maybe it's now. You're like the rat with the 200. You say, you know, Maybe it's the next one that is going to be important. You're driving down the street, you hear a beep, a ping, a, a, a something, and you say, maybe this is the important one. 
And as you say, maybe this is the important one. The odds are not very likely, but it's it's random. It could be that this is the important one. Then you check. And the more you check, the more frequently you get things. And, and there's, a, there's a cycle. There's a cycle in it. And it is rewarding and it is hard to stop. And let, let me make one other comment. People in, in my field, in, in behavioral economics and social science, we think that the design of the environment is very important. When you ask, how do we change behavior? We say, don't change people, change the environment. And our environment has not, des has not been designed for our long-term best interest. Right? Uh, our design is not, our environment is not designed to maximize us at retirement. It's designed to maximize somebody else's goals right now. We have all of these players, the environment, apps and coffee shops and supermarkets, and you walk down the street and they all want something from you. They all want your time, your money, your attention right now. Nobody, nobody when you walk down the street, no shop is saying, ooh, how do I make Raj healthier and wealthier and more calm 30 years from now? They all say, how do I get you to consume something right now? Some piece of content, some piece of food, a, a cookie, a coffee, whatever it is. So we have created an economy that is mostly trying to convince us to do things by going through our emotions. It's a temptation economy. Uh, you go to the supermarket, you have a plan of what, what you want to buy. The supermarket also has a plan. And their plan is not the same as your plan. And they have an easier time influencing you with their plan if they hit your emotional buttons, if they show you cookies and they push smell and so on. If there was somebody on the box in the beginning of the supermarket doing a lecture about the importance of fresh fruit and vegetables, something cognitive, it will not have a big effect. So, so we have created an economy that is based on temptation and appeal to our emotions. And because of that, we fail a lot. Now, we also manage to succeed a lot. I'm not saying we fail all the time. We, we also succeed a lot, but we fail too much. And we fail too much, and therefore we end up not doing the, the right thing. And if you ask me what we need to do, I think the first thing to do is, as individuals, to take control over our environment. So for example, on my phone, zero notifications right now you could say do i miss some things from time to time of course has it happened to me that i got to a room for a meeting and the meeting actually moved somewhere else i did but overall is it a good trade-off absolutely absolutely and um, by the way it's not only that i don't get notifications i don't even get the little numbers that say there are this number of messages waiting I say, I, my time is incredibly important. My attention is incredibly important. When I want to focus, I want to focus. And I like the idea that somebody could distract me when I decide to focus, that's really bad. When I don't want to focus, I'll go and check whatever I want. And yes, there's a cost to it. And sometimes I miss things and sometimes, but, but the overall benefit is tremendous. But the next step I think of course, is as a society, to realize that we're not really, we're taxing ourselves in a way that is unhealthy for us. Um, we did a study a few years ago on, on notifications. You know, people, people sleep with their phones. People check their phones at night. Uh, it's, it, it has terrible, terrible results. Mm -hmm. So does that mean the end goal being to take more control of your rational brain? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. so, so look, um, what, is, what is irrationality? Mm -hmm. uh, my, my view is that the human mind is like a Swiss army knife. Uh, you know, the Swiss army knife is, doesn't have any good tools. Like it's not the case that you would say, oh, I really want scissors, let me get the Swiss army knife. I really mm -hmm. want the can opener or I really want the screwdriver. 
it's not the ideal tool for anything, but it has lots of tools in a very compact piece. And our mind is a little bit like that. Not ideal for anything, but really good in lots of things. But our Swiss army knife was designed for many, many thousands of years ago. It wasn't designed for now. So we have this Swiss army knife. We have these things that were never that good from the beginning. But now they're also, a lot of the tools are irrelevant. We don't have a tool to deal with 30 years at retirement. We don't have a tool to deal with money. We don't have a tool to deal with cryptocurrency. We don't have a tool to figure out how to trust people that we don't know and will never meet again, or how to modulate our trust. There's lots of, lots of tools that were relevant to a small community in the savannah, but they're not, not relevant to, to the environment now. But of course, that's the, tool, that's the tool we have inside of us. And what it means is we need to make the environment compatible with those tools. Now you could say, oh, let's change people. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Not, not easy. Maybe you can change people a little bit from time to time. But, but in general, we need to make the, the world compatible. Think about cars. Cars are continuously improving by, the, by understanding the mistakes that people make and not teaching people to stop they, making these mistakes, but imp improving the cars, right? You could say, oh, let's just tell people to be better drivers. <laughs> nobody, nobody thinks that's a reasonable option. We, we have seat belts and we have anti-lock brakes and we have uh, notifications and we have distance uh, tracking and we have spots for the, the blind spots in the mirror. And we have so many things because we recognize like the, it's the, the way to reduce car accidents is not really to change people, it's to change the environment. So, so we do that. Now, you ask the question of do we want people to be more rational? Not always. So, you know, some of the wonderful things about us are irrational. Um, think about people climbing mountains running marathons, uh, writing poetry, helping other people. All of these are irrational. If, if you have a friend and he came to you and, he say, and you say, Raj, I open a new restaurant. I have this concept for a restaurant that will be X, Y, and Z. Should I open a new restaurant? Your advice to them should be, no, don't open a new restaurant. The odds are that you would lose lots of money. If you open a restaurant, right? most restaurants fail. But would you like to live in a city where no new restaurants are being opened? Of course, the answer is no. The individual is doing irrational things. We, the society, benefit from the people who succeed. Mm -hmm. So some of those people we fund. We call them startups. Many of those things we don't fund. Those are artists and uh, and, and people who open restaurants. So there's a lot of wonderful things about our irrational nature. We fall in love, we give money to charity, we help people, we care about people from uh, the other side of the world. Um, is everything that we do irrationally good? Of course not. Mm -hmm. but, but do we have also wonderful aspects to our irrationality? Absolutely. So, so what's the difference there between irrationality and the emotional aspects between us? Are they the same? No, not all irrationality is emotional. Mm -hmm. um, think about the journey that you are on to learn new things. You, you have your own journey. You invited me to join you for an hour on, on this journey. Um, it's an irrational journey. Right? What is the drive to learn and understand more? Right? From a rationality perspective, you should be seeking uh, money and I mean, there, there's, there are things you should be seeking, but it's not about a, an internal process of trying to learn new things. So it's an irrational journey. Um, dealing with money. We don't have tools to deal with money correctly. It's irrational. Now, with, in the money case, yes, I would love for people to understand more intuitively compound interest because I think then people would save more and, and spend less. 
but in your case, I think that the the journey of learning has its own intrinsic rewards that Absolutely. I think are fantastic, and I don't want to eliminate them. But it's not all emotional, right? You are You know, think about people who are becoming experts. Um, I talked I talked to an actor, and I asked him, "How do you, how do you do the same play day after day after day after day?" And what he told me that he's acting in two levels. He's acting at one level, and then at another level, he's noticing his own acting, and he's making minute changes. He said in the beginning, when he's learning a new part, he can't do that because he's just focusing on learning the new part. But once he got the new part down, he has another level that corresponds with his acting, but checks it. And he makes small variation. He projects his voice slightly more or slightly less. He takes longer pauses or less pauses. And he's saying that he's playing with this level of expertise making small variations and noticing that does his other actors react to it in a positive way, does the audience react to it in a positive way. And he is playing with his expertise and deriving a great satisfaction from that. Right now he's mastered that role and now he's playing with the, with the nuances and deriving great satisfaction from it. Um, fantastic, right? It's fantastic what, what kind of things we can draw satisfaction from. Not very rational. And, and by the way, he doesn't think the audience can tell too, too much the differences. It's for his mm -hmm. own interest and amusement and improvement and journey. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that uh, you sort of explained meditation in another way observing yourself, observing your reactions. And it's part of psychology as well, right? Because it's it's going to the core of your own nature and trying to adapt and embrace and change yourself to the very moment and going to the depths of your awareness, essentially. Yeah. Right? You know, I think, like, I, I, look at, I look at the range of human activities and I look at which one of them do we get a sense of satisfaction from, a sense of joy. Mm -hmm. So... The people who love playing tennis love playing tennis. You don't need to tell them, oh, please go and play tennis. Uh, I, I like playing squash. I, I, I don't have much time, but, but it's, the, it's the game I enjoy. But it's not about how many points I get from the other person. It's about the feedback mechanism. I, I want the ball to hit there, and it hits there. And I say, okay, let me fix it a little bit. And the next time I'm getting a little bit better, but it's this... It's this feedback mechanism. This is what I was trying to do. This is what happens. It happens very quickly. I don't have to wait a week or a year. I, I get an immediate feedback and I can immediately get a sense of improvement and so on. And I suspect that this is part of the joy that people get from yoga. And, you know, we have this sense that is called proprioception. It is about the location of our body in space. I think most of us are neglecting that sense. I can tell you, for me, I don't really understand where my body is. And sometimes when I go to a yoga class and they say things like breathe from your stomach or your back, I, I don't even understand what they have because I think lots of us have lost the sense of the exact position of our body in space. But I think that with yoga, especially with slow movements, people are honing that skill of knowing where their body is and having a feedback loop between this is what I wanted to do with my body, this is what my body actually did, and improving that. And I suspect that meditation has similar aspects. You know, people people think that meditation is, a, is about not doing anything, but I think it's actually, we get lots of feedback. The people who do it, I, I can't, but the people who do it, I think, get a lot of feedback. I'm trying to quiet my breath. I'm able to do this. I'm trying to do this. I'm able to do this. I'm not able to do it. So I think, I think there's a, a lot of sense like, like, like professional pianists when just we, without the piano that you try to do something and, and you get the feedback of whether you were successful or not. And you can play with the nuances of what's working better and what's 
what's working worse mm. it's uh, i do a bit of meditation myself and uh, i once attended a 10 day session where where there's no talking not even looking anybody in okay. the eye so you so Vipassana you just kind of yes yeah. have you have you done that no i uh, I, so, so i'm a bit i really want to do meditation mm-hmm. uh, usually uh, on january 1st i meditate once uh, after 10 minutes i am reminded of all the things i haven't done and i'm supposed to be doing i feel much more stressed <laughs> and i say i'll get back to it at some point i i think it's one of those things that again i'm sure it's great i have no way to envision how great mm-hmm. it is mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and therefore i'm not even investing the few months of going through it to to get the benefit of all the years of meditation what i get now is that if you have a central singular goal right so you might be tempted to do something you, like you are tempted to get up and do your work right and uh, that itself might be meditation because i was reading this book tools for titans from tim ferris and where he interviewed like 600 700 odd people from different industries from business cinema sports everything and he tried to he tried to fish out the common habits of these people and it's interesting that he found that 85% of those 600 people they meditate on a daily basis and and the i can i have a hunch from the inside that the rest 15% do their own they they are naturally meditating their natural meditation mm. they just they don't need to because it's that sort of a mindset that singular mindset that drive and that vision that long term vision i strongly believe this and and the evidence also shows that and in that sense uh i think i'm entitled to say that you might be already be meditating but you don't know it <laughs> thank you for that i yeah i it's it's one of those things that whenever i think about it it's a good like you know, yeah i'm mm-hmm. examining life whenever i think about it i know i should give it a few months and and try and see what can happen um but then then i don't Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know lots of lots of things in life you have to like think about energy um uh, you have some wood you have to put energy in and then you get more but you have to start by putting energy in mm-hmm. think lots of good things about life are like that you have to put to start by putting in some energy and then it it gives you back more but you have to start by giving some energy yeah but one important point i want to add is what we already spoke about in the beginning it's about breaking free from that patterned behavior sometimes we be- get so much affinity to it becomes sometimes some things becomes a part of our identity and we we it's very hard to break from that sort of patterned behavior because it affects our ego no. uh, uh wh- what have you learned about the psychology of human beliefs like what leads to our beliefs and sort of that sort of what like like we talked before it's what gives us happiness in in following our beliefs is what gives us happiness i love tennis playing tennis yeah. makes me happy i love podcasting doing podcasting makes me happy you love to learn about psychology psychology makes you happy it's your beliefs what have you learned from the psychology of beliefs yeah so so my my last book was on about beliefs um it, it's actually called misbelief misbelief yeah i read that because um in in that book i was very much concerned with with misbelief this was um uh, during covid i i was very villainized by a group of people who thought that i helped to bring about covid uh, so they they attacked me there was they um, threatened my life uh, it was it was very 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 tough and uh, but i i decided to try and understand this nature of misbelief because here were people that believed terrible things about me and no matter what i told them i couldn't change their minds and that was kind of such a stark experience that i said i have to understand this so i went on a journey to try and understand misbelief and i ended up being convinced that this is actually more important than i realized before and one of the biggest challenges we have in society you know as society we have to move forward in all kinds of ways together uh we have to decide about infrastructure and education and taxes and if there's ever another pandemic we have to act together and and we don't act like this we don't act like one society everything is political everything is polarized 
level of trust is very, very low. So, so we have these huge obstacles. If you think about any, any real big problem that you want to solve, if people don't believe and don't trust and we don't act together, nothing could, nothing could work out. But, but what I learned is that people who are misbelievers, and we all have them in our lives, right? We all have people that are kind of close circle, further away circle that we say, I don't know how this person believes that. Like, I don't understand what they do. And, and we say, but we're not going to talk about it. And, so, and, and that, by the way, not a good solution. <clears throat> what I learned is that falling to misbelief doesn't happen for nothing. It satisfies a deep psychological need. So think about a mosquito bite. When you have a mosquito bite, you have a real need to itch it. It's a real need to itch it. Is it a good thing to itch it? Of course not. But is it a real need? Yes. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I have a, two things I can believe. I can believe in a benevolent God who is making me happy and healthy and trying to protect me. Or I can believe that Fauci and Bill Gates are trying to implant a G5 chip in this vaccine and, and make my kids suffer. Oh, let me pick this one. No, nobody would pick that. It's not a, it's not a choice. But what happens is that people are stressed. When people are stressed, they are looking for a story that explains to them what is going on in the world. And they're looking for a villain to blame. And I don't mean the stress that says, gee, I'm so busy. I mean the stress that says, I don't understand the world. I don't understand why things are this way. I don't understand why I lost my job and other people didn't. I don't understand how come my significant other got sick. I don't understand what is happening in this lab in China or monkey or whatever it is. I don't understand, I don't understand, I don't understand. I don't understand one, one day they say yes mask, one day they say no mask. I don't understand what's going on. We need a story and a villain. That's where, that's where things start. And I think for our purpose here today, we can talk more about this, but I think for the purpose here today, it's important to realize two things. One is that we are at a, at a period in life with a lot of this kind of stress, this uncontrolled stress. You know, it's, it's COVID. It's social isolation, strange economic times, Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Hamas. I mean, you name it, the Houthis, I, like the, the amount of complexities and uh, the amount of animosity is, is just incredible. And not only do we have a very high level of stress, we also have a low level of resilience. So let's, let's think about resilience. Resilience is our antidote to stress. If you ask yourself, how much stress can you handle? How much resilience do you have? So what is stress? What is resilience? There's a concept called secure attachment. So imagine you have a kid. The kid is four years old. You take the kid to the park and you say, kid, go to the swings. The kid goes to the swings, comes back 45 minutes later. If that happened, you have a kid with secure attachment. On the other hand, if the same thing happened, kid, four years old, park, say, kid, go to the swings, the kid go to the swings, but every 90 seconds they look behind their back to see if you're still there. Not so successful in secure attachment. So secure attachment is the feeling that the kid has that you're there even if they can't see you. Now, usually, imagine this is a timeline. Usually we go around life, slightly better, slightly worse, we go around life. At some point, sometimes something really bad happens. Quality of life goes down dramatically. And then the question is, do we get back up? Do we get above where we started? What is called post-traumatic growth? Or do we get below where we start? Or the same place. And how long does it take us to get back? Usually we think about resilience as the recovery. But the reality is that even walking around life before something bad happens has a huge importance for resilience. It's whether you feel that if something bad would happen, somebody would catch you. 
just think about what it means in life to say, I can be in any city in the world, and if something bad will happen, somebody will catch me. Somebody will give me a place to stay. Somebody will give me a place to eat. Somebody will give me money for a flight. If my business fail, like, if you think about these things, it's incredible. It's incredible. So, and, and all of that resilience, this feeling that if something happens, somebody will catch me, is getting reduced. Why is it getting reduced? We have less friends. Uh, we spend less time with other people and we spend more time with our significant others. Uh, more, there's more and more time with the nuclear family, less time with friends. Like if you think about the old time movies, men came out of work and they went to the pub or to the, the bar. They didn't go home and women were hanging with their friends. I'm not saying everything old was good, but we had the real social network. Now we go home and we drive our kids, but we, we meet less and less friends. Also at work, there are pressures not to talk about personal things, right? Don't talk about politics, don't talk about romantic things, don't create a stressful environment at work. So our social networks, our real social networks, our meaningful ones have shrunk. We don't spend time, we don't have as many. And on top of that, we have an increased income inequality. And as income inequality increases, we are less and less likely to ask people for help. Even at the level of a neighborhood, if you live in a neighborhood that has an increased inequality, people are less likely to ask for help because asking for help is tough. And if people have different circumstances, we feel higher barrier mm -hmm. to ask for help. So we are at a time of high stress and low resilience. Also, I think that less and less people trust the state. Will the, will the my country be there for me if, if I fail, right? There are less and less of that, more and more self-resilience. So all of this is basically saying that we're kind of in a sensitive period, which means that we need to work on our own resilience. You know, when you, when you think about like the beginning of this, the unexamined life, I would, I would say to people, examine your resilience. Examine how many people are there that you feel really close to. How many people do you have that if you said, hey, I need you to fly 3,000 miles and pay $30,000 to bail me out of jail, that they will? Um, and if you don't have enough of those, um, it's a question of investing. I'm, I'm, you know, it, it sounds like it's very functional. It's not. But, you know, uh, how do we invest in creating more resilience for others? How do we invest in creating more resilience for ourselves? Uh, how does it integrate with our lives? I think incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Certainly one side of this equation is this social loneliness that we are feeling and uh, is does this information age also have a part to say in it because uh, I had another guest on my show and uh, his answer somewhat to this income inequality was that we are more we're getting more information now and and we can catch more fraudulent things now than before and that makes us question things. Yeah. And that also has a part in it. Yeah, so so look, I think that um, going to have coffee with people requires effort. Mm -hmm. um, texting somebody requires almost zero effort. Now, when you go to meet somebody for coffee or a glass of beer, it's a risky business. You will drive somewhere, you will have a coffee, maybe it will be good, maybe it will not be good, maybe it will not be the day that you will gain something. You say, oh, maybe I can just text them, say, hi, I think I'm thinking about you, and, and that's enough, and, and you, don't, you don't take risk. But what we don't see is the long-term creation of a real connection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so I, think, I think we... We choose not to put the energy into things because we're thinking about stuff in a myopic way. Mm -hmm. You can say, like, okay, 
So sending a text to somebody has no reward and no risk, or a tiny reward and no risk. Meeting somebody from coffee has a positive side, but it also has a downside. I could, I could finish this thing and say, what a waste of time. I drove all the way, I found parking, I paid $50 for parking and $10 for beer. And you know what? It wasn't that interesting. So, so we, we focus on the downside. We say, I don't want to feel that I wasted two hours in parking and, and so on. So let's, let me just text this person. But, but of course, we also sacrifice upside. Mm -hmm. So by focusing on the short-term downside, we actually minimize our upside. Hmm. Gotcha. Ah, follow-up question I wanted to ask there was, what percent of us humans are still apes? <laughs> I think a lot. Uh -huh. I think a lot of us, I mean, it's, you know, we, we, we all uh, have a, we all have something incredibly basic and evolutionary and so on. And uh, I think it's not that we're only that or only not that. Um, but in terms of our physiology, um, in terms of our connection with other people, in terms of our, um, you know, need, need for, uh, for love, for sex, uh, to have kids, uh, and so on. Um, I think I think there's a lot now. It's it's shaped. It's not ex not exactly like apes, obviously, right? But um, if you if you ask the question of what the, are the motives that drive us, but then get shaped later, a lot of the motives that drive us are very are very primitive. Um, but but I I was in Africa last year. Uh, and observing animals in the savanna is amazing. And uh, you basically see very, very complex social structure that is pure natural. Right? There's no evolved cognitive systems and, and so on. But you see animals warning other animals. You see animals coordinating. I mean, there's just... Uh, you look at this and you say, oh my goodness, here are these complex behaviors. But if we wanted, we could tell a long story about how they're thinking about everything very carefully. But it's not. It's uh, Evolution is uh, taking care of lots of those instincts and getting them to act in a very, very good way. Did watching them made you feel that we haven't changed that much? I think, I think it made me feel mostly on, in awe of nature. <laughs> uh, I think it made me feel like there's a there's a, a system. So you know, there's like okay, here are palm trees, and they grow, and the palm drops, but the palm is so tough that nobody can eat it. But elephants can eat it, and then they eat the shell. They're the only animal that can eat the the outside, and then they poop the inside, and now. Young palms can grow because now the, it's just the, the the seed, and like you say, oh my goodness, like how was this invented? Like if there were no elephants, they would nobody would have been able to eat this, and the and the young palms grow, and then other animals can eat them. Like everything has this connection and contribution and so on. So I was just I was just amazed by by the adaptability of nature and how everything seems to. Uh, to fit in such a lovely way. Um, it was also interesting to, like when I saw lions hunt, mm -hmm. I couldn't decide if who am I rooting for, <laughs> the lions or the antelope. <laughs> you know, the lions also don't have an easy life. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but anyway, it's a it's a fascinating like to to observe kind of the the complexity of nature for for a couple of weeks. And to think about ourselves in this in this way is, is very interesting. Certainly nature is cruel. Mother nature is cruel. Well, that was Dan Ariely sharing his views on The Seeker's Mind Talks. We hope you all enjoyed the show. And please do check out our other episodes as well. And let us know of your opinions in the comments. 
Thank you for watching and as usual I'm your host Raj signing off from The Seekers Mind Talks.